Good morning and welcome to worship at Orchard Ridge United Church of Christ. It's been a pleasure working with Diane Doolin this past week on our worship service for today. Since Diane's first visit to Palestine in 2011, she's devoted herself to advocacy and educational efforts on behalf of Palestinians. She's participated in multiple trips to Palestine, as well as hands-on humanitarian volunteer projects through her global mission partner, YWCA of Palestine. In today's service, not only will we hear Diane's sermon, which includes a couple stories from her visits to Palestine, but we'll view a trailer for the documentary, The Stones Cry Out, the story of Palestinian Christians. When we view this trailer, notice how the Israeli settlements take over hilltops and tower above the rural lands confiscated illegally from the Palestinians. After Diane's sermon, Palestinian Christians will sing for us in English, We Are Not Alone, and then in Arabic, the Lord's Prayer. We enter into worship prayerfully, reverently, and joyfully with an excerpt from Reverend Leo J. O'Donovan's Invocation Prayer. He offered it last Wednesday's inauguration ceremony of our President and Vice President. Please pray with me. Gracious and merciful God, today we confess our past failures to live according to our vision of equality, inclusion, and freedom for all. Yet we resolutely commit to renewing the vision, to caring for one another in word and deed, especially the least among us, and so becoming the light of the world. Love calls us to give ever more of itself. Amen. I invite you now to send a text, email, or Facebook message to others in the church, extending to them the peace of Christ. Receive now these greetings of peace from a few members of the congregation. God's peace to you. Hi, I'm Phil. And I'm Judy Winkle. And we're happy to be with you today. First, we want to thank all of you who have worked hard to keep the church functioning during these trying times. We're missing all of you and looking forward to the time when we can be together again. Hi, we're the Durolves. I'm Lynn. This is Erica. Hi, I'm Andy. This is Cora. <laughs> we're new to the church, but we look forward to meeting all of you when we can. Hi, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Goodbye. <laughs> Hello to all my church family and friends at Orchard Ridge UCC. I'm Amy Beckett, and this is my fiance, Phil Hart. Hello. Sending you wishes for peace and hope in the new year. I'm Julie Beckett, thinking about my church family during these interesting times. I hope that everybody is staying well and safe and warm. Hi, I'm Betsy Van Way, and I've been thinking about what I miss most about church, and it's Bethany and Handbell Choir. I really miss her positive attitude and how upbeat she is, and what a fantastic director she is. I can't wait to get back to Bell. Hi, I'm uh, Betsy's husband, Ron, and I'm grateful for that hour I used to get. I mean, I missed that hour I used to get uh, when handbell was played. Happy New Year from Burnt Hills, New York, and from Madison. We miss you, and we hope you're well. Hello, everybody. My name's Anthony, or Tony Holt, if you like. Um, uh, we're, we're delighted to be here, and we only wish we could be here in person and uh, meet you all and shake a hand or two. But that's not going to happen for the, for the moment, and we look forward to the time when it does happen. And we wish you a Merry uh, Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we wish you um, every, every time... Uh, every uh, possible goodness for 2021. So until then, bye. And I'm Beverly Taylor, Tony's wife. Uh, I've been coming to the church for about six or seven years, and Tony joined after we were married about a year and a half ago. Uh, we're taking our tree down. We're the last people in the world to have it up. I can't calm my cowlick 
and we have done about 15 takes bursting into laughter. So how other people made it look easy, I don't know. But please take our heartfelt wishes for a happy, prosperous, loving, just 2021. And uh, can't wait till we can hug you in person. Bye. The Palestinian Christian community is a very special community. This is where it's all started. Christians have lived continuously throughout the Middle East since the day of Pentecost, more than 2,000 years ago. They are the descendants of those early followers of Christ, yet few are even aware of their existence. It's very important that all the Christian locations do not just become archaeological sites or museums. The living aspect of Christianity in Palestine is disappearing. كانت ساعة سودة لما قعدوا فجروا البيوت مشان يقطعونا الأمل ما نرجعش. They were always crying and asking God, what have we done? كل يوم رغيف وشقف يعطونا. أنا روحة شهادة. There can be no excuse for the illegal and arbitrary confiscation of furniture and household belongings. While I was growing up, I thought it was the problem of the previous generation. After 67, I felt now it's become my issue. They have their aims. Now it is very clear, very evident. They want all the land. My youngest son, and he said, Mom, after what we suffered and born, this is the end, is to bury us alive in a big tomb forever. I just hugged them and cried. Don't come just to run where Jesus walked, but come to meet the living stones.
Today's sacred readings are from Isaiah 64 and Mark 1. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked, at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you and your ways. But you are angry, and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Now, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the witness of the people of God. From the land of Jesus' birth, stories are born. From the land where Jesus grew up, stars shine with revelation. Messages come from women and men and prophets. And Jesus once said, even the stones would shout out their recognition of my message if my followers are forced to be silent. From my journeys to the land of Jesus' birth, I've come home with some stories of my own. During this sermon, I want to tell you two of them. We are still in the season of Epiphany, a season of revealing Jesus and recognizing Jesus. For me, that is essentially what my stories are about. It's also true that we live in a timely season where we are encouraged these days both to show up and to stay home. While as an introvert, I'm comfortable staying home, as an activist, I know how important it is to show up. So the stories I tell you are my way of allowing you to show up in the lives of Palestinians in the Holy Land, even if you've not had the opportunity to travel there yourself. I'm hoping my stories might put some names and faces on the lives of the living stones in Palestine today. Almost every time I visit Palestine, I spend several days in the home of Nicola and Lorette Zubi, Roman Catholics who live very near and worship at the Church of the Nativity. The Bethlehem Church considered the longest continuing Christian congregation in the world, built on land, considered the site of Jesus' birth. 
On one of my visits to Lorette and Nicola's home, I joined a small group of fellow travelers who rose early in the morning darkness, not to go to church, but instead to arrive at checkpoint 300 by 5 a.m. Checkpoint 300 is one of the busiest of hundreds of military checkpoints spread all across Palestine. My small group's intent was to witness the rather hellish transit made by thousands of Bethlehem residents daily through the separation wall, the apartheid wall, a wall which marks how near the people of Bethlehem are to Jerusalem, yet how very far away they are kept. By way of background, Bethlehem is situated in the West Bank, so it is under Israeli military occupation. Bethlehem is divided from nearby Jerusalem and the rest of Israel by a huge concrete wall, a wall which is twice as high and three times as long as the Berlin Wall. The wall does not follow the Green Line established after the 1967 war. Instead, 85% of the 400 mile wall cuts into Palestinian land to rob Palestinians of homes, family farms, aquifers, whole village, as well as a blocking access to schools, medical care and places of worship. So although Jerusalem is just down the road from Bethlehem, it feels like a million miles away for the vast majority of Bethlehem residents who cannot travel there. Some have never been there because they lack a travel permit to do so. However, a small percentage of Palestinian men and women do possess a coveted travel pass, allowing them to find jobs in Jerusalem. Palestinians are highly skilled and very well educated and of course, they're paid less than Israelis. So Israelis like to hire them to do work others are less able or unwilling to do. In order to reach their jobs on time each morning, men and women begin lining up at checkpoint 300 at 4 a.m. since it often takes hours to get to the other side. The best way to allow you to imagine that morning scene at checkpoint 300 is to compare it to a crowded cattle yard. People are pressed together in long crowded lines behind turnstiles, elbows to chin. They push and jostle to keep their place in line. The lanes don't simply open up at a stated time, but instead open and close unpredictably to let in small numbers of the commuters at a time, followed by another long period of waiting. The opening and closing is a matter of Israeli whim and Palestinian stress and indignity every day. Even on the best days, it takes the 5,000 people who pass through each morning several hours to make the journey. The morning my group was there, we waited an hour in the lane marked humanitarian available to those with medical needs or possessing foreign passports but it never opened. Word eventually reached us that it never would open that day. So we pushed our way back through the densely packed crowd of workers in the opposite direction of the turnstile. Then directed to the head of a new line by those we passed, we did as internationals what we were allowed to do, entering the checkpoint examination area by way of an empty exit line. It was white privilege in its purest form. I tell you this story not because it was dramatic. It wasn't dramatic, it was mundane. It was just another day in the life of Palestinians who try to make a living despite the heavy thumb of Israel pressed down upon every aspect of their lives. The people of Bethlehem live every day with multiple checkpoints that are designed to be humiliating, unpredictable, and scary. The travel restrictions based on ethnicity provide one of the clearest justifications for calling the Israeli system an apartheid system. All the power belongs to Israel, 
One can never be certain when checkpoints will be open, what the mood will be of the young soldier staffing that checkpoint, and whether one's pass may be revoked for no reason. Using another dimension of privilege unavailable to Palestinians, once we reach the turnstile because of our foreign-born whiteness, our American passports quickly allowed a wave through. From the other part of the other side of the checkpoint and the other side of our privilege, we pause to watch Palestinian workers stop, display their papers place a finger on the American-made Hewlett-Packard designed biometric identification device, and then quickly sprint to a waiting van in hopes of arriving to work on time. A group watched for a while and then formed a circle to pray and to read words of Jesus from the beginning of his public ministry, words we needed to hear from Luke. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, has sent me to proclaim release for the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. God has sent me to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable time, the kairos of the Lord. And then from today's gospel lesson in Mark, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Here's my second story of Bethlehem. This one takes place in a tiny Muslim farming village not far from Bethlehem. Wadi Fakin is situated in a fertile valley watered by natural springs that are fed through a valuable hillside aquifer. It sits between the apartheid wall and the green line. So its residents are cut off both from the West Bank and from Israel. You could call Wadi Fukin a land of milk and honey, but then you would have to include the huge concrete wall, the sniper towers, the Jewish only bypass roads and the military checkpoints into your more pastoral image of what milk and honey seems to connote. The abundant water resources of the valley where Wadi Fukin is located have made it a prime target for land theft by Israel. Wadi Fukin is one of many Palestinian villages living under the shadow of a huge Israeli settlement built atop hills on confiscated land. I place that word settlement in quotation marks because Although settlement sounds small and benign, maybe even a bit cozy, Israeli settlements are usually large, built-up cities filled with imposing white stone apartment blocks. These, the huge settlement of Beitar Elite, which looks down on Wadi Fukin, is one of these. Its current population is now over 59,000 compared with the population of Wadi Fukin, which is 1,300. Our group's visit to the small village began with a couple hours harvesting olives in the backyard of a family, followed by a short drive to some beautiful, small but beautiful fields of leafy green vegetables. For many generations, rural Wadi Fukin has been the source of fresh food for the city of Bethlehem. The trouble is that 90% of the land of Wadi Fukin has now been stolen by Beitar Elite, a theft which continues as new buildings are constructed. By incremental steps, the ever-growing Beitar Elite settlement has expanded down the hillside toward the village. And as a final blow, the Beitar Elite settlement releases its raw sewage down that hill to pollute the Palestinian agricultural fields below. Chemical tests will confirm what your nose tells you about this sewage. This poisoning of land occurs all throughout the West Bank. In the numerous places, Israel places its settlements, all of them illegal under the fourth 
Geneva Convention. And so it is in the context of stories like my visit to Checkpoint 300 and the village of Wadi Fukin that I hear the prophet Isaiah urgently calling out to God in our lesson, oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down to make thy name known to thy adversaries, that the nations might tremble at thy presence. I suspect this is the lament and the cry in one form or another of many who long for God's protection and rescue. It is the cry of many who call out to God to show up and yet see the perpetrators of injustice flourish. When faced with intractable evil, seeming to outsmart and overpower the vulnerable, we turn to passages like this one, powerful words of scripture which give voice to our anguish, words which name our heartbreak and help us struggle to remember or believe that God hears our cries. A passage which cries out for God to show up, implicitly accuses God, it seems to me, of currently going absent, or at least being invisible. And yet it is also true that crying out to God, show up, be present, keeps our relationship with God alive, and our laments are sometimes what keep our conversation with God going. And then in those sacred moments, those Kairos moments of fulfillment, when we find we are not crying to God alone, but join others who share a concern and our heartbreak, who join us in our struggle or our despair and help us persevere. Well, sometimes this is the best and most life-saving purpose in our worship. For Palestinians, this perseverance is called Samud. Palestinians possess Samud in a supply which seems unlimited. And I tell you these stories to bear witness to the perseverance and the faith I have seen at a crowded, pre-dawn checkpoint in Bethlehem and in a little valley near a huge wall with sewage running down the hill. We are now halfway through the season of Epiphany, the weeks following Christmas, weeks which focus on revealing who Jesus is and what he has come to say. This season of the church wants to teach us again every year, both how to call out to God and how to hear the answer which comes from Jesus. In this season, the church calls us to remember how to long for God, how to see God's face. And today in this particular season of our lives, a season of rampant pandemic, ongoing racial injustice, and grave political turmoil, we are called in this season to reawaken the sharp reality of just how much we need to see God's face in our lives. And so we say, show up, we need you. The time is fulfilled. Let the people say, Amen. We are not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. God is with us. We are not alone. We are not alone. We I'm not alone, God is with us. We
Pray silently the Lord's Prayer as Palestinian Christians sing for us the Lord's Prayer in Arabic. Abana Lazi Fissamawat. Yes, in the way. We are the Kodas is more.
our service has come to an end. Please pray with me. God of all times, places, and seasons, today we pray for the people of Israel, Palestine, that they may discover the path to peace and reconciliation. For our Muslim brothers and sisters in Israel, Palestine this day, we pray, Assalamu Alaikum. For our Jewish brothers and sisters in Israel, Palestine this day, we pray, Shalom Aleichem. For our Christian brothers and sisters in Israel, Palestine this day, we pray, the peace of Christ. Amen. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Go now in peace.